So in the last video, we talked about the ring oscillator. And we analyzed it from a small signal perspective. So we said, if we have a few of these uh, common source amplifiers cascaded together with certain resistances, RD, and they're just cascaded together like so. And we want to analyze the poles of the system. We can, from that analysis, determine when the circuit will oscillate and at what frequency. And so we assumed we had some RDs here and some capacitances, we called it CL, um, at the output of each node. But this was just a small signal analysis. So we were treating the transistors just as uh, current sources. And we didn't even include the, the output resistance of the transistor. So in a lot of ways, the analysis was incomplete. It's valid when the signal involved in, is small, but often in oscillators, uh, we don't want the signal to be small. We want it to be, say, from 0 to VDD. And in that case, the signal is most certainly not small. And so if we want to do a more complete analysis, uh, we should ask the question, well, what does, how does this change uh, as we move into the uh, move into the large signal region of the uh, of the circuit. So for that, um, we're going to analyze this circuit using the CMOS inverter rather than the common source amplifier, uh, partly because it's easier and partly because it's much more common to use CMOS amplifiers. No one uses, or few people use common source amplifiers in ring oscillators. So this is our simple CMOS inverter. V in, V out. We're going to assume that the PMOS and the NMOS transistor are both matched to each other, so they have the same drive capability. This isn't completely realistic because their capacitances are going to differ and whatnot, but it's it's fine for, for our analysis. And so we're going to treat this like a single, uh, this is the single circuit element that we're going to use to represent the inverter. So it's got an input and an output. Well, okay, great. Um, so if we connected a bunch of them together, let's say, uh, let's just connect three for now. And let's assume uh, that on either side, there's just an infinite chain of inverters. So there's an infinite chain to the left and there's an infinite chain to the right. Well, if we put, if we apply an input step uh, at the very first inverter, so infinitely far away, and then we wait for a while, and finally the signal will get to our first inverter and it'll look a little smoothed out. So it'll look like this. Uh, let, me, let me redraw this so it's a little larger. So the input signal will look something like this. It'll have a certain rise time to it. It won't be perfectly square, but after you run it through an infinite number of inverters, it'll have this smoothed characteristic that doesn't change as you run it through further inverters. So if this is the input that appears here, then we know that the inverter takes some time to charge the capacitance uh, on this next node. So it doesn't instantaneously change. And, but it will eventually, uh, say after a certain time period, uh, let's call this uh, TP. Uh, after a certain time period, it'll change from being, the output will change from being high to being low. And you might say, well, why did you choose that? Why did you measure this point on the, on the line? Why did you choose what looks like the halfway point? Um, and it is the halfway point, and I did that for a very specific reason. So we're assuming that the inverters are matched. So the NMOS and the PMOS have the same drive capability. And so if we measure the Let's say we measure the third inverter as well. We wait a little, wait a little, wait a little, and then it transitions from high to low after the signal propagates. Well, then we have another time. Uh, it takes a, another time, TP, uh, to get there. So the 50% rise time is the most useful measure for symmetric inverters because there's no dead time in between. It's just it takes TP for the signal to propagate from one inverter to the next, and then it takes TP for it to propagate the next to the next. And then it'll, after N propagations, it'll take N times TP uh, for the output to get high. Well, okay, 
using this analysis, we can pretty easily calculate the frequency of oscillation. So let's pretend that we, uh, we cut <clears throat> this infinite chain and let's just connect these inverters back to each other. And really uh, the interesting thing about this is we haven't really done anything because we have an infinite chain of inverters here. Uh, it's one inversion by this inverter, another inversion, another inversion. And as it goes from high to low uh, at this node, it goes from low to high at this node, high to low at this node, and low to high at this node. So it'll continue propagating around the loop forever and ever and ever. And that's why I use the infinite chain of inverters in the beginning. Well, how long is it going to take? Well, we know uh, at the, and let's, let's just redraw this underneath real quick. We know if we've got a signal from the first inverter, let's say at time zero, we apply a normally, so a, a, a pulse that's already been shaped by an infinite number of inverters. So let's say this is t equals zero. Uh, and then we wait for it to propagate to the second inverter. So I'm going to draw this guy in green and this guy in red. And we wait some time for it to propagate to the second inverter. Well, we know it's gonna take time TP. So we say that this time is T equals TP. And then for the third inverter, we wait, we wait, we wait, and then it inverts at T equals two TP. So it gets to 50% at T equals two TP. And then Eventually, the signal will propagate back uh, to our original input. So at t equals 3tp, our input, uh, which is now our output, at uh, t equals 3tp, will go from high to low. And from this, if we continue this uh, on further, um, we can see that this is one half of a period, uh, because this is just the high cycle of an oscillation. We know that there's going to be a low cycle after that that's going to last just as long. And so the time that it takes for one full oscillation, if we look at any one of these nodes, uh, so this node is going to look like this. We're going to wait for 3TP, then it's going to go down 3TP, up 3TP. So this time is 3 times TP. This time is 3 times TP. And this time is 3 times TP. And similarly, if we look at the green signal, it's going to look similar, uh, just inverted and delayed, like so. Uh, so this is going to be 3TP. This is going to be 3TP. So at each inverter, the um, and this I've, I've somewhat exaggerated the waveform. It's not actually going to end up being this flat, uh, but you get the basic idea. So the period. The overall period of oscillation is six times the propagation time, or the frequency of oscillation is one over six times the propagation time. Now, if instead of three inverters, uh, we wanted to have, say, five inverters, uh, we could do that. Um, five inverters. And we could carry out a similar analysis. Wow, those are some ugly inverters. Um, and it would show us that the frequency of oscillation now is 1 over 10 TP. And you'll see this, uh, see this pattern. It's um, staring us right in the face. Uh, for n inverters, the frequency of oscillation is just 1 over 2 times n times the propagation delay. That's going to be the frequency of oscillation of our ring oscillator. And you might say, well, what, what about if we wanted uh, two inverters or four inverters? Uh, would, that, would that oscillate? And the short answer is no, it wouldn't, um, because this set of cross-coupled inverters, uh, if, you, if you will, um, has a stable operation point. So if this is zero volts and this is five volts, or VDD, um, then this is five volts, then this should be zero volts. And indeed it is. So there's no reason that this circuit wants to change. Uh, now this can be overcome by using differential oscillators or differential ring oscillators, which I'll go over in the next video. Uh, but basically, instead of 
having one signal, uh, you've got a plus and a minus signal, plus and a minus, and you essentially flip. Um, I'll, I'll explain this further in the next video, but you uh, flip the plus to the minus and the minus to the plus, and that's how you can get away with only using uh, two, two inverters. And uh, so I'll go over that in the next video.